Hello and um, welcome again to um, another OpenShift Commons briefing. Uh, this day is Wednesday in June, so it's been um, quite an interesting year. I think we're up to number 77 in our um, briefing series. And this is yet another talk on monitoring because monitoring seems to be one of the most popular things and maybe some of the most, um, or one of the most um, diverse group of things because it means so many different things to so many different people. And a couple of weeks ago, we had Brian Brazil from Robust Perception come on and talk a little bit about Prometheus and, and other aspects of um, using that, um, that technique for monitoring um, OpenShift and Kubernetes. And out of that conversation, we decided that we needed to have a higher level conversation about what monitoring means for cloud natives so that we could kind of level the playing field. So we brought Brian back again. Um, we're gonna get him to give a little bit of a, an overview of the whole thing, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end and the conversation. So without further ado, Brian, take it away. Hello. So as uh, Dan said, I'm Brian Brazel, and I'm here to talk about what monitoring means, because a lot of the time when people are talking to each other about monitoring, they're really talking past each other. So to give you a bit of background about who I am, uh, I am one of the core developers of Prometheus, even though this is not a Prometheus talk at all. This is much more high level than that. I was in Google for a few years. I contributed to a number of open source projects, and I work professionally in monitoring, doing consulting and support for Prometheus, uh, in the course of which I interact with a lot of under monitoring systems because people want to uh, integrate them. So you will learn a lot about how they all work and all the differences. So let's consider the word monitoring. 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 Like when you see this word, are you thinking the same sort of things that I am thinking? And that's kind of the question I want to look and address here. So I want to start off and do some history. Because if you talk to a lot of people today, what we do is really based on things that were really good ideas many decades ago. This is back in the day, uh, well before things like OpenShift existed, uh, where you had a handful of machines, like never even a full rack, they were cared for by citizens who were more artisans and giving lo loving care and attention to everything. And special cases were the norm. Um, the thing is that our, our tools have moved on greatly. For example, we went from manual configuration uh, to tools like Chef and now to Kubernetes and OpenShift. But practices, many of them are still stuck back in those days. And we're often, uh, to quote someone else, still feeding the machine with human blood. <laughs> and doing lots of things which are basically just burning people out uh, for, you know, not any appropriate gain in productivity for anyone. So I want to start then by just looking at some of the tools, uh, that the historical tools, and many of which are actually still used today. So we're going to start with looking at MRTG and ORD. So in 1994, uh, Tobias created a Perl script, uh, which was MRTG and you know, 95 was released, and it was used to graph SNMP priority, which is network stats. And in fact, there are many of these websites still around today with these graphs. Anytime you come to an internet exchange and they have graphs, they're probably still MRTG. Uh, and it started off storing the data just in a big ASCII file that was rewritten every time, which isn't exactly performant. It was moved to C like two, three years later, um, and later on, there was ORD called the Round Robin Database, uh, which improved performance rather than rewriting an ASCII file. And that was all released in, in 1999. And ORD is actually the basis of a lot of more modern tools uh, like Graphite, although it has a more advanced system these days. So if you've ever seen a graph that looks like this, it's from MRTG. So very common for bandwidth, as I said. So that's kind of your graphing. On the other side, you have your alerting. So it actually started out in 96 uh, as an MS-DOS application, not at all a Unix thing. And all it did was pings. Uh, it became like a proper project in 98. And first release was in 99 as NetSaint, uh, which got renamed in 2002 because there were legal reasons. So basically what it does is it runs scripts on a regular basis. And if the exit code is not zero, it sends an alert. 
there are a lot of projects which are inspired by the Nagios way of doing things. So if, for example, have Ashinga, uh, which is pretty is an extension of it. You have Sensu, and you have Zedmon, which is a Python version, which actually comes from a Germany, German clothing company called Zalando, who have offices here in Dublin, as it happens. And Nagios looks something like this. You have a machine, and it has checks, which are the scripts that are passing and failing. Um, and the thing is that because we had this world where on one hand you had MRTG and the other hand you had Nagios, graphing, which is, a, which is all your white box monitoring, which is looking inside the application, and alerting, which is black box, so from outside the application, and they are separate concerns, separate tools. And this is all from a world as well, where all machines were special, services only tended to live on one machine because we didn't have the scale that required more than that. And it's also a situation that because things were small, like not many machines, not many services, if there was even a slight deviation, uh, there would be an engineer to just jump on that problem. This is not the world we have in a cloud native environment with a system like OpenShift, where we ought to think of the machines and services as cattle rather than pets, and where deviation is the norm because we just have so many machines that that's going to happen. So, if we're going to ask what monitoring is then in the modern age, uh, we need something that's not just alerting, graphing, and jumping on everything that might be a problem. And we also need to look at things beyond uh, what the machine has. We need to care about logs as well and browser events because, well, lots of users are using web browsers to access things, and the JavaScript in their browsers is getting pretty complex and needs to be monitored in and of itself. So what I think we should do then is rather than looking at what the tools have, Let's look instead at the problem statement of what we're trying to do. What are we trying to do with all of this monitoring? And I kind of see there to be four categories of monitoring, which is knowing things can go wrong, debugging, trending, and then plumbing. So we're going to look at each in turn. So the primary thing for monitoring is alerting. Okay, if you're in Nagios, that's almost all it's going to be doing. So the thing is that we're trying to put things go wrong. The question is, what is the wrongness we want to detect? Do we want to look for a blip because, you know, that happened that a packet was lost due to a solar ray? Or do we actually want to focus on latency affecting end users? Because in the end of the day, we want to care about whatever product it is we're producing, whether that be a social good or something for money or just the back office process that's handy to have. Um, and we want to focus on that sort of thing rather than everything, because if you alert on everything, that just isn't going to work. Because the thing is that humans are very limited in what we can handle. We can't work 24-7. We need reasonable amounts of sleep. And if you get alert on every single thing that could be a problem, you're just going to burn out and get what's called alert fatigue, pager fatigue. There's a few other names from it. It's basically burnout. And burnout is bad. That's not the best way to use people at all. Because we're engineers and we should treat problems like engineers. And the kind of a key insight there is that you care about, let's say, user-facing latency. And there are hundreds of things that could cause that. A machine could have failed. The rack switch could be slow. You could have lost some power. Mating routing changed. And you're now going the long way around Europe. You cannot possibly alert every single one of those. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of them, and you're going to miss some. However, what you care about at the end of the day isn't that a rack switch has failed. It is that the user is having a bad experience. So if you can alert directly on the user having a bad experience, that's just one alert, and it's going to catch a multitude of problems, real problems. So let's take the canonical example for this, which is CPU usage. There are systems where you cannot directly alert on the latency of your servers, because that's just not information that's exposing or useful. But you do have CPU usage, because, well, if you have, say, a process running inside Apache, and it's using all of your CPU, you can bet that things are slow. But there are also going to be false positives there. So if log rotate or whatever background processes that run nightly are taking too long, that's going to give you a false positive. If there's a deadlock in your code, uh, well, it's just going to lock up and use no CPU, and you're not going to detect that either. So what a test tends to result in is spammy alerts. And you know whoever is receiving these alerts just tends to ignore them, which ultimately means, because of that alert fatigue, that they're going to miss real, real problems because it's going to look at it and just go, oh, it's that again, and let's continue on with whatever they were doing. So the thing is, that alerts should require intelligent human action. We're engineers, you know, not automatons. 
and it relates as well to end user problems. Users do not care in the slightest if your machine has a load average of four. In fact, in modern systems, load average isn't even a particularly useful metric. However, they do care if they can't view their cat videos. So think about cat videos, not load averages. The second thing you have is that, well, after you've gotten that alert, what are you going to do about it? Because if we're going to follow the guideline previously and all we have is a high-level symptom, well, that's great, but where do we start going? And the thing is, if you're looking talking to the microservice architecture built on something like OpenShift, you're going to have some form of like tree structure. And what you want to do is just use the scientific method, start at the top, and drill down into your problem. So if you have high latency and two backends, you might start at the very root of your tree, the, you know, the front end HTTP server, and say, right, is it overloaded? Yes or no? And then check, okay, it's backends. Has either of them gotten slow? It's like, oh, this backend's gotten slow. Right, same process again. Is it overloaded? Oh, yes, it is overloaded. Great. We now we found our problem. Back, its backends look fine. Let's dig into further that with more tools. And the thing is as well is that there is no panacea. There is no one tool that is going to help you debug. You have to bring in a myriad of tools depending on how complicated the problem is, what the nature of the problem is. So metrics, for example, are great for figuring out roughly where the problem is, but they're never going to tell you exactly which request from a user is to blame. For that, you need logs. Neither metrics nor logs are likely to tell you which line of code needs to be optimized. That's something for profiling. And then all of those are going to tie back to source code so you can see what's going on, what the code is, and you're going to jump between these as you try to narrow down a problem. And the third case then is trending and reporting. Because alerting and debugging is short term, you're talking minutes to days, maybe weeks. Trending, on the other hand, you're talking months to years. So for example, you might want to notice that your cache hit rate is changing over time and add or remove machines. Like if your cache hit rate is starting to get to like 1%, you can just get rid of the machines, they aren't helping you. On the other hand, if it's really up to 90%, maybe you can get rid of some other machines. Uh, if maybe you're instrumenting your features uh, to know, hey, so this obscure feature we added was removed, well checked, no one's used it in two years. So then it's pretty safe that you can remove that code and that's no longer gonna break your continuous integrations. And a most common one, of course, is capacity planning, which is like, when will I need more machines? You want to see how the cost per query is increasing over time and how the number of queries are increasing over time. So lots of trending and reporting stuff there that you need for engineering purposes and you need for business purposes. Uh, the final, the fourth case I see for monitoring is plumbing. Because no matter what you design your monitoring system to do, someone is going to look at it and go, hmm, I want to get data from A to B, and you have a thingy that kind of has data that could use as a transport. Can I use your monitoring system? Now, this isn't monitoring, but someone is going to ask for it. If it's kind of free, like they want to transfer a log line a minute or you know a metric, that's not necessarily even a bad idea rather than building a proper solution, but can also get more expensive. So something to consider with your monitoring system is what happens when people start using it for other stuff? And at what point do you tell them to, you know what, now is the time to break it out into a proper solution rather than just piggybacking on our rather critical monitoring system. So we have like the three goals of monitoring and plumbing on the side. What, what are we going to do about it? What data do we want? How do we want to collect that data? And the thing as well is that monitoring isn't free. You can't collect everything all the time because that's going to be more data than you're actually processing in the first place. And then when you try to monitor data, it would explode exponentially. So we need to decide what trade-offs we're going to make. So the core of all monitoring, I will contest, is the event. So an event might be a HTTP request, package, a function call, or anything. And there's also context, like who is the user who made that, what IP address is it from, what machines is that hitting on the path? Uh, what sort of business request is it? And how much data is involved? And you can imagine as an event works through the call stack, might work through like 10, 20 servers and hundreds of functions, it might be thousands of pieces of context, context associated with this event. And there might be millions of these events per second as you know, you've got requests cascading through the system. And there's kind of four, roughly four classes 
of dealing with events and how you view them. When you're talking to someone and they say the word monitoring, they normally mean one of these. Uh, the question is which one of them? And that's where a lot of the disconnects come around the word monitoring, is they mean one of these or alerting. So let's look at each in turn. So profiling is a pretty broad area. The short version is if Brenton Gregg has ever talked about it, it's profiling. So he's got a great blog, lots of uh, tools, uh, like the Berkeley packet filter. Uh, so TCP dump, GDB, S trace, D trace, what's in common is they get you a lot of detailed information about individual events. But the problem is because that's a detailed information about individual events, that's kind of expensive. So you can't turn these on all the time because they're too expensive and you can't point them at everything because it's too expensive. So you end up saying like, right, I'm just gonna monitor this process for like 30 seconds and hope no one notices, uh, which is how CPU profiling currently works. So these are great tools. If you kind of have an idea of what's going wrong, like if you know something weird's happening on the network uh, with TCP, then use TCP dump. Or you know, hey, there's some weird syscalls, you can use S-trace. Uh, but you kind of need to know what you're looking for before you start using a profiling tool. Uh, metrics then, they take a different trade-off. Their trade-off is they're going to ignore individual events. But we're gonna track how often particular context shows up. So examples here are Prometheus, Graphite, and anything else in that space. So you wouldn't be tracking like for each HTTP request the time it came up with that, but you do know how many there were in the last while, how many have failed, how many. The question is always how many or how much, not individual requests. And you also have one of these cases where one of them hits an odd code path and it's going to increment a metric, but you're not tracking usual events, you're kind of just tracking how many or how much. The thing is metrics is they're handy because you can have lots and lots of these how many questions, but you can't break them out by too many dimensions. So like if you were to break out metrics by email address, you, if you have millions of users, that's going to take out most monitoring systems. So what metrics are good for is breadth, across your code base and know what's going on and kind of just drilling down and doing your initial debugging steps when you get an alert. Uh, but for tracking individual events and really getting down to the nitty gritty, you need something else. Which brings us to logs, which are kind of like the opposite to metrics. So they track individual events, but they track a limited pieces of information for it. So you know it was Mr. Fu who is this endpoint this time, got this response with this status code. But well, you can only have so many of those fields, like 50 to 100, uh, before you run into bandwidth issues, whether that be disk bandwidth or network bandwidth, uh, just because you're tracking for every single event. Uh, the examples are the ELK stack, the ELK stack, uh, or Greylog, and yeah, you would have also commercial tools here like Splunk. Um, but with logs, it gets even a little more complicated because just as monitoring has like five or six common meanings, and those are just the common ones, there's also a few different types of logs and you need to be specific about which one you're talking about because each of them have different reliability requirements, different volumes uh, and other considerations. So I'm going to say that there's roughly four types of logs. So you have your transactional logs. This is anything you cannot lose. So that might be required for billing, it might be required for legal reasons, it might be passing on to other systems. Like losing them is just not an option. You must do everything in your power to stop them being lost. You have request logs. So if you're logging individual HTTP requests or anything that's tied to a request, it's a request log. And you've got application logs, which are different from request logs, and they're telling you about the application and its background processes and what's generally going on in the application as a kind of a management system as distinct from the actual requests. So things like garbage collection or SIG hub or other managementy stuff and backgroundy stuff happening inside an application. And then you have the bug logs which might be very detailed stuff like exact request information, individual function calls. It basically is profiling, massive data volumes. And because of that, it's generally not practical to keep these for very long. But these are all different types of logs. And if someone says, you can't ever lose logs, they're probably talking about transactional logs. But they're saying, no, you must look every detail ever, they're talking about the bug logs. Because trying to reach the bug logs as transactional logs will not end well. And for example, application logs, you normally want those to be readable by a human without any tooling in terms of volume. 
The fourth one then is distributed tracing. It's really a special case of logging because normally logs across different machines are independent. What distributed tracing does is each request, like each end user request gets a unique ID that's propagated as all of its sub requests prop, uh, cascade to the system. And then something like open tracing, open zip can like stitches these all back together. So you can see the entire history of these requests. So th this is useful in distributed systems, particularly where you've got many services, many interconnections for figuring out when weird stuff happens. So it is essential if you've got a microservice architecture on something like OpenShift. Here's an example here from OpenZipkin. And you can see here how we've got the big overall request here. And here's my SQL part, more MySQL, and all the other servers it's talking to. And you can see how this is traced over time. So that's very useful for debugging. So if we go back to the question of what monitoring means, it's not just some black box alerts going to a knock. It's not per host graphs or aggregated white box graphs like you get from Prometheus. It's not just logs. It's not just metrics. And it's not just a big TV screen on a wall, uh, which is where a lot of monitoring seems to end, unfortunately. So the way I would see it is monitoring is the tools and techniques you use to keep an eye on your system, see what it's doing, and keep it functional. There is no silver bullet out there that is going to solve your monitoring problems, right? You need multiple different things. You need your metrics, you need your logs, you need your profiling, you need distributed tracing. And as well, to keep in mind, culture and policy and people are also part of your monitoring system. It isn't just technology and computers. You need to think about how you're going to organize your on-call shifts to make sure that people still get holidays and can see their families. And all these things come in together. So then to summarize this, uh, the goals of monitoring as I see them is knowing when things go wrong, being able to debug and, and gain insight, trending, and plumbing because it's going to happen. And then the classes of monitoring systems, we've got profiling. It has lots of data, but so much that you can only use it very briefly. Metrics, they're great for breadth, but they don't work too well with depth. Whereas logs, they're great for depth, but not good for breadth. And distributed tracing, basically you need it for distributed systems because some stuff you just can't really practically capture with the others. And so the final thing I would say to you is that don't just be held back from what we did 20 years ago. We need to take advantage as you go into a cloud native world using great tools like OpenShift to take advantage of all the classes of monitoring systems because we must scale ourselves as engineers. We no longer provision machines individually, right? We get Amazon to do it, we use Packer or whatever. Um, and we shouldn't similarly care about a single machine being dead or slow. We should be caring about services and end users. Uh, and I hear kind of Prometheus is good. Uh, so are there any questions? So we, we all hear Prometheus is kind of good. Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty rock and awesome. You know, I have to get a plug in, right? You definitely do, and I, and I think you should. As as one of the core uh, contributors to it, I think it's it's um it's been a pretty much of an eye opener, and, and its use with Grafana and other things has really made monitoring quite quite nice. Um, I, I'm wondering what you see um as the future or where monitoring is going, and and and, and what I kind of want to inject is is a little bit of the idea of predictive modeling. Um. I, you know, we've been, I've been talking a lot with um, some of the Apache Spark folks who have been doing deep dives on OpenShift log files and things like that. And we had talked so much about being event centric, like this happened and therefore that, you know, we must be alerted or, you know, the, the profiling things. But um, what do you see if, in your wish list with all of this data? as some of the things going forward in the future that you'd like to see happen um, for monitoring? Yeah, so in relation to like predictive stuff, uh, I, I kind of wish people would stop thinking it's a panacea yeah. uh, because it isn't. In fact, it barely works because the problem is uh, what you're talking about there is building effectively a machine learning model of some form. And if you have a system like Prometheus, which is used to getting like a thousand metrics per application instance, and you might have a thousand of those, and you're sampling those once a minute, and you've got, you know, that 150,000 samples per second coming in through the system. There is just going to be so much noise in there that actually putting out any useful information 
with a reasonable to signal to noise ratio doesn't work. Uh, so the way that someone pushed me, someone who works on machine learning systems, you know, the more traditional ones, uh, is that it takes 18 months to train a model. Yeah. Uh, which, if we translate that to monitoring, means it's going to take you 18 months to set up a single alert. That kind and of that's, is not, that's very not a good trade-off. Yeah, that's not very useful when you can't get to your cat videos, really. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So you could, you know, have someone figure out exact uh, levels of traffic and so on, but it's going to require a lot of maintenance and tweaking. And I would take the approach that for most things, the vast majority, a simple static threshold is good enough. Rather yeah. than, you know, spending a lot of time on something you're going to spend tweaking anyway. Yeah. And yeah, I, 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 only, I only say that because I'm, I've been playing um, and, and looking at some of the Apache Spark stuff that's been coming out. And because we have such huge historical data files and lots of information coming in, it always looks like, a, you know, great data yeah, stuff. Yeah. Train yeah. learning things. Well, the thing is, if you have logs, because there's fewer fields, there's less potential for noise. Yeah. Uh, so that can also work. So basis where you often will see some form of prediction is capacity planning, because there you're not looking at millions of metrics. There you're looking at like three or five, because you only care about global traffic or regional traffic, and there's only so many regions. And it's a really important number for costing and figuring out how many machines you need to buy. Uh, so for those, it can make sense to spend the half engineer it takes, like the permanent half engineer or half statistician or whatever, to get come up with a model for yeah. that. Well, I, and I also think um, as we change, have changed over to this cloud um, native model or this just cloud basis things, and we and we really do change from. I really. I love the the metaphor you used at the very beginning about um, human blood in the mach machine, as well as the pet versus cattle conversation <laughs> too. Is that, is that having been a sysadmin back in the early '80s, I remember the blood in the machine, and you know, every, and having pagers early on, you know, and thinking we were special people because you know only doctors and sysadmins and DBAs had pagers back in the day. Um, and then realizing what a pain in the arse that was um, and the human cost of um, always being alerted every time any strange thing happened. I think that um, in this world where we're more concerned about um, the outcomes um, and the availability of the system as opposed to why did this one machine go down because something is so quickly replaced, um, everything changes and so the tools yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't mean you can throw away your Nagios or other things because some of that stuff is absolutely still necessary um, to keep keep up and running. And so, um, yeah, yeah. So the approach to scale is better because like the Nagios style systems think, still think about the machine, where we should, like in the OpenShift sense, be thinking about the replica set. Yeah. And and I, and I think that's the funny thing about cloud is people always think of this ethereal floaty thing out there and the Ether, um, and they forget that there are actually server farms out there somewhere heating up the, the, the environment and um, the real machines. And so there's this play off of what do we use as people who are developing apps and deploying clusters of pods um, onto clouds to monitor our systems um, versus you know the people who actually are putting those machines and servers together. And you know so there's there's two sets, and you know, I think it's it's been it's been a great talk actually today, breaking it out by the different things, um, the different aspects. So um, hopefully today's talk has given everybody a good sense of not just the history but where we're going um, and the different aspects of monitoring as well. So I really appreciate your time today, um, Brian. Um, not seeing any questions, but mm -hmm. um, that may be because. Um, it is a high level thing and we didn't actually do a real demo here, but we will do lots more demos um, up and coming as well. So stay tuned for some of our um, upcoming uh, OpenShift Commons briefings because monitoring is near and dear to all of our hearts. And you had an upcoming event in August, PromCom? Yes, PromCom. In fact, ticket sales started there yesterday. Uh, so you can get those at PromCon.io. And what's the dates for that? It's August 17th and 18th. Tickets are just 80 euro. 
or if you want a chance to win free tickets, uh, my company is actually raffling some off. So if you just sign up to our mailing list, which you can find a link on, of, on our website, you've got a chance to win some free tickets. Perfect. And, and it's Munich, there's good beer. Yeah. So it's Pom Pom is always um, a fun, it's a rather small event, but it's growing. And I think yep. this time it's in, it's in Munich. Yeah, it's um, in Munich, yeah. So last year we were uh, 80 people, this year we're 200. It's it's definitely a big community and it's, it's happening. So um, if you want to take advantage of that, and also I'm sure there'll be a lot of Prometheus folks um, talking at KubeCon in Austin, where we're going to host the next OpenShift Commons gathering in December. So hopefully we can get Brian there as well. Um, I'm not planning on, but I think Julius is going. Julius, maybe Julius. We'll get some. We'll get some robust perception insights there. I'm sure. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go back to your days, and um, thank you very much, everybody, for um, coming on and. Um, listening in and we'll put this one up on the OpenShift blog shortly along with the slides. Take care.